Well, welcome. Good to be with you today. My name is Todd. I serve as the pastor here at Reve Church. And man, I'm so excited about this series that we're starting today called Mindsets. And really the month of May is a big month for us here as a church because uh, we're starting a new collection uh, today. We've got Mother's Day happening next Sunday. We've got our Soul Good team, which is our women's community here at Reve Church. They're taking over Mother's Day weekend and they've got a sweet gift they're giving to all the ladies uh, next Sunday, so you don't want to miss that. We've also got an ocean baptism and newcomers happening all in the month of May. I'm super pumped uh, about mindsets, though. Today is part one. And in 1976, there were these very strange, massive uh, circles and and symbols and patterns that began to appear uh, throughout cornfields in England, and it, it kind of started this this phenomenon. These things were so massive that you couldn't really see them unless you were in a plane flying above. And 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 scientists began to come and, and study them. New age people began to come and and you know interpret their meaning. In fact, some people thought that they were created by aliens. Uh, and, and there was all of these, you know, conspiracies about these strange patterns that happened in, in these fields throughout England. And then on September 9th in 1991, Doug and Dave Corley uh, came forward with a bold claim. And they let the world know, because the world was really watching as, as all of this was happening, they let the world know that they were in fact behind these strange patterns that were happening in these, in these fields. Uh, they, they said, you know, it wasn't aliens, it was, it was us. And, and they claimed to be uh, pranksters. In fact, they told the reporters that how they came up with the idea. They were, they, they were uh, out one night and they had one pint too many and they came up with this idea and, and really uh, created this phenomenon uh, that, that uh, people were just, you know, basically sucked into. And they actually brought all of these reporters together one day and they gave a demonstration. And Doug and Dave, they, they, had, these, uh, they had these wooden like, like pallets or, or these wooden planks that were attached to rope. And they began to, in front of these reporters, they began to create these designs and patterns in front of all the reporters with, their, with these tools. And they would, they would uh, you know, basically create these pathways throughout this cornfield that created these massive patterns uh, in the field. And at the end of uh, their demonstration, the reporters uh, walked away and they were like, nah, nah, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't it. <laughs> and that couldn't have been you guys. And, and Doug and Dave were like, yes, it was. Uh, it was us. In a very general way, uh, this is how our brain works. Now, I'm not a neuro, uh, neuroscientist, okay? I'm not a brain scientist, uh, but uh, in, a, in a very generic way, this is how your brain works. In fact, our brains are constantly creating new pathways, uh, ultimately creating large patterns of thinking in our minds, and it creates the way that we see the world, the way we see ourselves, and the way we perceive our situation. In fact, reality is not reality. Your perception is reality. That's how powerful uh, uh, this topic of mindsets really, really is. And many years ago, uh, scientists believed that our brain was fixed, that, that through our genetic code, that our thinking was set and, and our brains were, were, were set and, and you could not change them. But over recent years, neuroscientists have discovered something called uh, neuroplasticity. And they've found that our brains are far less fixed and far more like, uh, you know, like, a, like something like Plato, right? Like, like, like Plato can be shaped, it can be molded, and, and so can our brains that we can actually create new pathways of thinking. And we can retrain our brains. We can mold and we can uh, re kind of recreate our minds in the way we think and the way we perceive the world. 
And the coolest part about this whole series, this series is really an intersection of neuroscience and and the Bible, because the coolest part about this is that the Bible actually affirms and, and agrees with the best part of neuroscience. In fact, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. It says this, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is our key verse. So here's what I want you to do right up front. I want you to memorize this verse. I want you to print it out and put it on your refrigerator. I want you to, you know, cut it out and put it in your car, stick it in your wallet, or put it in your note section on your phone. Romans 12 and verse 2 is our key verse for this whole series. And here's the why behind this whole collection. Again, let's read the verse. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. This verse says that you can change your life for the better and you don't need a raise. This verse says that that you can change your life for the better and you don't need a new relationship. This verse says that, that you can change your life for the better and you don't need to be better looking. You're already good looking. Uh, you, you don't need that to change your life. You can transform your life. You can change your life just by changing the way you think. I was talking to my dad recently. He's 79, and, and he has a family history of Alzheimer's, and I was adopted. Uh, so I, he is my dad, but we share very different bi- biological and genetic uh, code. Uh, but in his family history, there's Alzheimer's, and so his doctor recently gave him some mental exercises to begin doing. And one of them is my dad started to shave with his left hand. He's right-handed. All right, so he's shaving now every morning with his left hand. What is my dad doing? He's retraining his brain. He's creating a new pathway in his mind. He's trying something new. He's doing something that's not familiar, uh, creating this new pathway to get a new result in his life. The truth is, is that God has incredible things in store for you. No eye has seen, no mind has imagined what God has in store for your future. The future is full of hope. And yet the tragic truth is, is that many of us will never experience the fullness of all that God has for us this side of eternity because we don't understand this concept of retraining our brain, creating new pathways to get new results. You see this this theme all throughout scripture. In fact, Proverbs 23 and verse 7 says this, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What does that mean? It means that your thoughts are powerful. That your thoughts are, the the direction of your thoughts is usually the direction that your life is moving. Now, here's the problem that we all have. We all have at least two enemies. Now, you may have more than two enemies. If you count your ex, your, your, your old boss that fired you, and your neighbor who smokes weed too much. Okay, if you don't count those, we all have, we all have at least two enemies. There's a part of Eastern philosophy uh, that says, you know, your problems are outside of you. And your solution uh, to those problems are inside of you. So look within. The problem with that thinking, the problem with that belief is that it's not true. Your, your, your solution is not inside of you. In fact, the Bible says it's the exact opposite. The scriptures teach us that your greatest obstacle to the life that you really want to live is inside of you. In fact, even if you don't believe in God, you have language for this. We, we talk about this all the time. Like, he's got his demons. She's, she's just battling her demons. If you're from the South, we, we're more polite. Right? And, and you, you say, uh, oh, oh, bless her heart. Right? Like we have language for this. But the, the, the greatest obstacle between us and, and the life that we really want to live is living on the in. 
side of us. Look at this next sequence in Romans 7 and verse 15. The writer says this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Have you been there before? So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work where? Within me. And the writer ends this section uh, in verse 25 and says this, Thanks be to God that we have hope. Thanks be to God that we have a solution. And the solution is not inside of you. The solution, he says, is uh, Jesus Christ. He is the one that's going to deliver us. But we all have an enemy within. The Bible calls it the flesh that battles against us and wars against us. You see, our solution is not in ourselves. Our solution is Christ. But we also have a spiritual enemy. One of the biggest challenges that we face today as followers of Jesus is that we, when we think of the devil, sometimes we think of this. You see this image on your screen. And I just want to tell you, just want to inform you that this is not what the devil looks like. If you see this guy at your house, you know, today, this week, this month, call the police. <laughs> you're, you're being robbed, right? That's not what the, the, what the devil looks like. But we have a very real spiritual enemy who wants to destroy your life. Look at this next verse, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be alert. Be of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He wants to take you out. He wants to devour you. He wants to destroy you. John 10.10 10 says that he wants to steal, kill, and destroy everything that is good, everything that is pure from your life. I want you to imagine for a moment. You've been transported today to Ukraine. And the only difference in the scenario is that you are the only one on planet that does not know there's a war going on there. But you have been transported, you have been beamed over to Ukraine, and you are in the middle of a battlefield. I mean, bombs are blowing up, bodies are falling beside you, bullets are flying all around you. But the most shocking part of this scenario is that is not that there's a war the most shocking part is that you didn't know there was a war and as impossible as it is to imagine that type of scenario this is how so many followers of Jesus live their lives we fail to realize that we are in a war and that war is being fought on the battlefield of our mind. Look at what this verse says in Ephesians 6 and verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Like, like your, your neighbor is not your enemy. Your, your boss is not really your enemy. We don't fight against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers, against authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And so when your spiritual enemy comes to attack you, most of the time it happens on the battlefield of your mind. He, he, he puts those patterns of doubt in your thoughts. He puts those thoughts of suspicion, those thoughts of fear, those thoughts of condemnation. Here's the key thought for today. Every thought that you have is not your own. Every thought that you think is not your own. So you have to pay attention to what you're thinking about. You have to pay attention to why you are thinking those thoughts. But make no mistake, there is a battle going on in your mind. Your spiritual enemy wants to ruin 
your life by ruining your thoughts. And it's not about externals. In fact, you could have everything going great. You could have everything going right on the outside. And yet on the inside, you there's a war going on. I remember a year ago, my wife and I, we celebrated our 20-year anniversary. Come on, 20 years. It's amazing. Uh, we went to Hawaii. We, uh, we were so pumped up about this trip because uh, we went on a vacation that was paid for. Uh, by us. <laughs> we, we, we saved for it. We live on a budget. We paid with cash, you know, for this vacation. And, and we went to Hawaii for, uh, for a week. We were so pumped up about this. So, so excited to celebrate this 20-year anniversary, this really exciting time. And, and, yet, and yet, during that time, I can tell you we were in paradise. We were looking at this blue ocean. The sun was shining. We were at this awesome resort, white sand beaches. That was what was going on on the outside. But in the inside, I kept on having these thoughts. Like, what if if something happens to my kids? Like, what if my wife doesn't like the hotel? Like, what what about this and what about... Like, there was this battle going on in my mind. See, it's not about externals. You can have everything going right on the outside, and yet we still have this war going on in our minds. So as we continue, I want you to do this quick audit. This is called a thought audit. And this is, I got this from Life Church uh, in Oklahoma. And, and I, want, I want to take you through this, this thought audit because over the next five weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to track our progress because we're going to give you principles. We're going to give you application. And you're going to begin to understand how all of this works and how you can win the war in your mind, how you can create new pathways to get new results in your life. So this is going to give us a baseline. So here's the first one. Uh, Are you more worried? Worried is like towards number one. Or are you more peaceful? Peaceful is number 10. The second one here is, are you more negative? Do you tend to have more negative thoughts? Or do you tend to have more positive thoughts? thoughts. The third is, are you more, do you tend to think more worldly? Or do you think more eternal? I want you to rate yourself on each of these. Here's the question. What is a mindset? I mean, there's so many different types of mindset, but the Bible actually gives us two. And we see them in Romans 8 verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. This, this writer says uh, there's two mindsets. Right? There's two. Uh, he says you can either have a mindset on the flesh or you can have a mindset on the spirit. But whatever your mindset is on, your life is going to follow. So the writer says a mindset on the flesh leads to death. But a mindset on the spirit, on the things of God, on the things that are pure, on the things that are holy, is life and peace. Let me ask you, do you need a little bit more life and peace? I know I do. But how do we get there? We have to retrain our brain. We have to create new pathways. Remember, not every thought that you have is your own. So you have to pay attention to what you're thinking about. You have to pay attention to why you are thinking those thoughts. So let's let's give some application here. Here's number one. It's a word. It is remove. If we're going to begin this process, there are things, there are thoughts that we have to remove. At our family home in, uh, on the East Coast um, that we lived in before we moved to San Diego, we had a yard that was oftentimes full of weeds. And so I had this desire to, you know, have this lush, you know, green, uh, full green grass, uh, you know, in my yard, okay? But, but what, what most of the time happened was uh, there were, I would get all of these weeds. 
And so I began to talk to different experts who could help me get this lush, you know, green grass that I really, really wanted. And what I found out was that in order, before I, I planted new grass, before I planted new grass seed, I had to remove the weeds first. I had to remove and, and uproot the weeds so that I could plant new seed. Now, if I didn't do it that way, then my yard was going to keep on getting overgrown and overwhelmed by weeds. Strangely enough, this is how it works with mindsets. This is one of these things that, that we don't always focus on. This is one of those things that we don't always think about. But there's actually things that you need to remove from your thoughts. There's, there's some things you need to remove from your life. But this is in part why we do a 21-day fast every single year. We actually do it twice a year, once in January, once in July. We fast for 21 days. We fast and pray. Well, Todd, what is fasting? Fasting is just removing something for a spiritual purpose. It's taking some things out of your life. Biblically, it would be food. But today, you know, you could be, you know, take social media out or, you know, I'm going to not eat this meal or I'm going to intermittently fast certain things, certain times. You're removing things from your life for a spiritual purpose. Purpose. Now, again, remember, remember, every thought that you have is not your own. So we have to pay attention. And sometimes, as we begin this process, sometimes there's thoughts that we have to remove. And sometimes when you have a foreign thought, you have to exit out. Now, have you ever gone to a website and, and you go to that website, you're trying to read an article or you're trying to get some information, and there's this pop-up ad? Are you familiar with pop-up ads, right? And sometimes those pop-up ads, they have those hidden X's in the corner. You can't really see it. They, don't, they want to disguise it. They don't want you to notice it. So you see the ad for a little bit longer, but you have to click on that X to get rid of the pop-up ad. This is how it works with our thoughts. When you have those foreign thoughts, sometimes you have to click on that X, you got to click on that X and delete and remove that thought. It's kind of like when I go to the gym and I see an attractive woman and I have this thought and I think, that's not my wife. <laughs> that is not my wife, right? And, and so I have to click on the X to get rid of that thought. Don't get confused on who your spouse is, all right? That's just a little extra. But every time I see an attractive woman, I have to say, listen, that is not my wife. I'm Xing out lust. I'm Xing out doubt. I'm Xing out fear. But I have to understand, ultimately, this is how it works. I have to remove some thoughts from my life. Look what the writer says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation. I love this verse. It says that it's talking about this idea of getting rid of things. Some of you are in a relationship you need to get rid of. Some of you have an addiction, an old habit you need to get rid of. Some of you have you know, just different thoughts, that, different mindsets. You've got to get rid of this. This writer is saying that when we do that process, when we go through this spring cleaning of our lives, that, that we're actually participating with God and growing up. Has any, ever, anyone ever told you to grow up? Like, just grow up, bro. Like, I've been told that so many times in my life. But there's a maturing process that happens and takes place when we get rid of things. When we remove certain thoughts and certain uh, things from our life. There's two ways I want to apply this. Okay, the first is found in Philippians 3 and verse 13. The writer says this, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. So the writer here is talking about this concept of forgetting. 
He's like, hey, this is one of my focuses in life. This is one of my focuses as a professional. I am forgetting. This is one of my focuses uh, in my relationship with God. I am for, there are certain things that I am forgetting. Now, biblically, remembering works the opposite as forgetting. Thanks, Todd. That, that, that was brilliant. That, that's just genius, right? <laughs> Remembering works the opposite as forgetting. Like in Psalm 77, it says, remember the works of the Lord. See, there are certain things in our life that, that when we remember them, it's actually a, a spiritual strength because you remember the faithfulness of God. You remember how he got you through a pandemic. You remember how he provided in certain ways. You remember about all the good things that he's done in your life. And it brings you this spiritual strength. But when we remember the wrong things, it works the opposite. It zaps our strength. It creates shame in our lives. And so there's certain things that we need to remember, and there's certain things that we need to forget. And the writer says, I'm focusing all on this one thing. I'm forgetting the past. I'm forgetting the disappointment. I'm forgetting the failure. Like, I'm letting it go. I, there was a time a couple years ago, I was praying about something in my own life, and, and, and I just felt like God gave me this verse from, from Jeremiah 49 that, that says, um, forget the former things. I'm doing something new. I felt like God just spoke in my spirit, not audibly, but just I sensed that God was saying to me, like, Todd, just let it go. I'm doing something new in your life. And that's a word for some of you today. You got to forget the past. God's doing something new. And the future depends on you forgetting certain things. And the future is more important than the past. The past is behind you. I'm reaching ahead, the writer says. I'm reaching for what's ahead, for what God is calling me to. This one thing I do, I'm forgetting what's behind me. Uh, what, what is one thing that you need to forget? Here's the second part. This is such a powerful verse as we close today. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. It says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The, the, the writer here is using this war language. The weapons of our war are not of this world. But they have, they have this supernatural power to what? Destroy strongholds. Well, Todd, what's a stronghold? A stronghold is any thought, any thought that you have, any thought that I have that, that prevents me from getting God's truth in my heart. It's any thought that you have that, that prevents God's truth from coming into your life, from coming into your spirit. Let me give you just a few examples of this. When I was a child, I had a relative uh, who said, Todd, you're going to be bald by the time you're, you're 30. And that, 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 that saying or that, you know, what they said to me kind of stuck in my brain and, and I began becoming OCD over my hair. A dear friend of mine when I was a teenager uh, said something very hurtful uh, to me, and 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 again, that kind of that what he said just kind of stuck in my mind, and, and it and it and it began uh, kind of making me think. You know, I'm never going to have a healthy relationship in my life. When I first became a follower of Jesus, I felt called into the ministry. Like some people, you know, they don't know what they're going to do with their lives. But I got that word when I was 19 years old. But I just come to faith, but I didn't live my life to be a pastor, to be in the ministry. And so I had this thought, like, I'm not good enough. And it almost prevented me from going into ministry. 
For years, I thought I couldn't be a senior leader. I couldn't lead my own church. And and that belief, that stronghold, kept me in a previous job too long. I'm embarrassed to say that I stayed in that role far too long before, before, you know, uh, way, way, way too long. But it was that fear, it was that fear that held me prisoner to not step out and do my own thing. You see, you have the power to destroy the strongholds in your life. You have the power to retrain your mind, to create new pathways so you can have new results. Here's here's the two questions I want to ask you as we close. What is one thing from your past that you need to forget? And what is one stronghold that you need to identify and remove because it's truly preventing you from living the life that God has called you to. Hey, let me pray for us as we close. God, thank you so much for this moment. God, I pray that you would give us the courage. God, that you would give us your spirit in in fullness, God, to live out everything that we've talked about. God, to create new pathways, to transform our minds, ultimately to, to live new lives for you. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.